can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, um, and some you've heard of, some you've never heard of, and I'm gonna introduce today's guest in a second, Fran Biederman Gross, and Fran, I always like to hear about the challenge stories, and so, you know, uh, Fran was actually nice enough to introduce to Andrea Herrera of Box Experience, so definitely check out that episode, and Fran actually helped them come up with, she, she gives you a bunch of shout outs, Fran, of coming up with the name and, and all the kind of the um, residual stuff around the campaign. So we'll talk a little about that and we're going to talk lumpy mail. We're going to go deep in lumpy mail. If you aren't using direct response or lumpy mail, I think you're missing out. And so I love to geek out on this topic. And before we, um, I introduce today's guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. I co-founded my business partner, John Corcoran. And uh, we help B2B businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients, and we help you run your podcast. And, you know, Fran, for me, I know for you, it's the same thing. The number one thing in my life is relationships. And so I'm always looking at ways to give to my relationships. And a podcast is a way, I've, I've not seen any better way to profile them, their thought leadership, their company, give to them on the podcast. So if you have questions about podcasting, we've been doing it for over 10 years, you can go to rise25.com. You can hear John and I bantering like an old married couple on the video um, and check it out. Uh, and today's guest, I am super excited to chat with. Um, just a breath of experience, Fran Biederman Gross. This is the CEO and founder of Advantages and it's an award-winning New York-based end-to-end communications agency. Um, she is also the co-author of the book, How to Lead a Values-Based Professional Services Firm. Three Keys to Unlock Purpose and Profit, which she wrote with Don Scales. Check that out. Um, there's videos on YouTube about it. And um, I just, uh, I love their philosophy and starting with purpose. Uh, Fran works with senior executives to help them clearly see the results of a purpose-driven marketing and leadership. And you know, Fran, I know the kind of the answer of the book is you were helping Don and you were brainstorming. You're like, listen, we need to go deep on the purpose here. And there's always a pushback with CEOs like, is that fluffy stuff, right? Is that really going to help the bottom line? And you've proven that over and over again, when you focus on the purpose and values and the mission and through your book, Purpose, Values, and Story, that really empowers leaders and organizations to infuse the meaning, which, which allows them to have a why, which allows them to drive the sales, right? So, Absolutely. So thanks for joining me and um, <clears throat> people can check you out advantages.net. So um, I'm super excited to dig in. And I, you know, we're going to talk about lumpy mail, but I want to start with the book for a second and the how you came up with the title and kind of, you know, part of how you came up with the title is you go in to a company and you're thinking purpose and values first. So what's your approach when you go in to help a company? So first of all, I love talking about the book. It's my kind of favorite topic. Um, especially these days. So the book is a bit of an organic uh, result of me being hired to join an internal competition, a logo competition. And a close friend of mine said, hey, the CMO is having trouble finding a purpose-driven agency to design a logo. And I'm like, yeah, you know why? Because we build brands. We design logos, but we actually build brands and the logos that represent the brand we built. And I hate when people challenge me. But she's like, Fran, it's a really interesting opportunity. Go take it. And I did. And the, re the end result was of that meeting, uh, I did. I joined the competition. It was three internal teams. I had never heard of this global company, Investus, before. They had merged with Zog Digital. Their new mandate was investusdigital.com. You should go check them out. It's great branding. Um, and I did. I presented in 42 minutes. I pretty much took all their briefs in a very polite way. I interviewed. The only thing I had, by the way, in 30 days was a deadline to come up with some, some logos and the creative briefs and the individual briefs that I had from the prior companies and anything I could find on LinkedIn and Google. That's it. 
Um, I also had 30 minutes, 30 minutes and no more with eight global executives who were on the decision-making committee. That's it. So I started with the CEO, Don. Uh, By the way, this is such a tough task because yeah. <laughs> it's so subjective. Like one person could think this is the best logo we've ever seen in our entire lives. Another person could say, I think my third creator can do that. So it's, it's, it's terribly subjective. It, it, listen, design is subjective, period. Yeah. And it is not an easy task. But I figured, listen, I had nothing to lose. And I don't, don't like I'm super competitive. It's a, it's a terrible strength that I have. And I did compete against myself because I was about, and it really, as much as it was competing against them, it was about like, what could I do in 30 days to design something that would have meaning um, and, and probably actually politely challenge what they gave me, which is what I did, and then deliver four incredible logos. I don't know all of them were so incredible, but again, it's about, it's subjective. So it was about what everybody liked. And of course they saved the best for last. I gave it to them in a digital way so they could feel it. They could touch it. I printed business cards with them. So they really were able to interact yeah. with it. Um, when I left, the CEO said, I've been doing this a long time. That was 42 minutes of value that I haven't seen in a while. So wow. I kind of felt like, wow, I, that, was, that was a great compliment. And of course they said, hey, we'll let you know if you made it to the semifinals, we'll call you tomorrow. I, to this day, I have never seen any of the other work. And they just said, um, and I was surprised because the CEO called me, not the CMO who hired me and said, great presentation. Congratulations. You made it to the semifinals. I want to see you in my office Monday. And I'm like, no problem. What did you do on the presentation? Uh, so, you know, we culminated these 30 minute one way conversations, right? It's not a lot of questions we could really ask but we had to validate what we already knew and we had to be really smart about it. So I said, here's what you presented. This is what the story you're talking about. Here are the things that I heard in these conversations and all the things that we read. If I were building the brand, here's how I would present the story. Here are some of the things that I would consider adding or, you know, taking into consideration and the core values I would, you know, I kind of position it. You've got these strengths that you've all talked about, but I don't see represented here. And you talked about your competitive, you know, your competitors and your aspir your aspirational competitors and your actual competitors. And I charted sort of where they were uh, from a color component and found the white space, picked two different color palettes to give them as many options as possible, warm and cold, and then designed warm and cold logos in all traditional, non-traditional. And we ended up, you know, winning unanimously because that was the rule. And uh, when Don called me to tell me that we won, I was like, great, when can we go out to dinner to celebrate? And as he's answering me, we can go like, you know, a week from Tuesday because I'm in London, I'll be back. I'm like, did you just ask a global CEO out to dinner? And um, I don't know, the rest is kind of history. We went out to dinner and we didn't talk about business at all. I was really so curious about his journey and all the things I learned about him when I was doing my research. And uh, I wanted to learn, of course, more about him. And he, he was just so intriguing, such a purposeful individual leading uh, a global organization. It was just, it was kind of really fascinating. And we headed off um, like two peas in a pod and we just kept going out to dinner and going out to dinner. And, um, and he asked me to, you know, help him roll out the brand kind of behind the curtain, which we did. Um, definitely a couple of lessons to do that from that position because it was definitely pretty, not, I was not, I did not win popularity of coming in and bringing the brand company that won the logo, right, from their incredibly strong, talented teams. And um, I, one day, a couple months later, he's like, you know, this whole framework that you've got me thinking about and God, it was a horrible thing, <laughs> this slog, as he affectionately calls it. Um, but, you know, David Meister wrote this book that's really very popular and very well done in, for professional services and how to manage them. And this has really got to be the 2.0. And I'm like, I'm a branding and marketing expert. He goes, exactly. You have the right approach. And it, it you know, purpose unlocks profit in every aspect. And in helping as many companies as we do, I really have... I really have the experience and the stories like he does just from a different perspective. So it was a very yin yang opposites attract uh, beautiful story. 
and um, we're still friends today. So that's good. So purpose, values, and story. I know, um, you know, in my research, you're like, you decided to not just include the, the greatest story, success stories, but there are some, you know, I don't know, uh, mistake stories or not failure failures, stories, journey, failure, failure stories. stories. You know, people don't like failure, like learning experiences. But sure. so what's one of those, you know, quote unquote failure stories that you decided, listen, let's be transparent here and open up some of the failures, not the successes. You know, when we were writing this, there's one story that totally pops into my mind um, and I'm going to share it. But I, I, you always learn more from failure, right? You always learn more from things that you can learn from. So you have to be vulnerable so that if you're really truly going to share, that's the place to share, right? Success is great and all, all of this worked and this is how we do it and that's great. But here's where I realized there was a problem. So uh, one day, I, I don't remember exactly what we were meeting on, um, but I really didn't behave in the way a leader should. And I really got very emotional and lost, you know, I have this rule, A, B, C, D, E, no assuming, blaming, complaining, defending, or excusing. And when you come to meetings that way, when you're working, if you're, you take the emotion out of it and you're just dealing with facts and you're just dealing with statistics and you're just dealing with metrics, you, you know what to do. And I let my emotion get the better of me for whatever reason for this particular client. And the client was in the room and my team was in the room. And I just, I just, honestly, I just got a, a just a, probably a D minus. And when the clients left, I was still in the room because we take pictures of everything we, you know, kind of draw on the boards to create notes. And I'm just taking my few minutes to do that. And there goes Angelica walks into the room, slams the door, slams down the water bottle with water going everywhere and says, you cannot do that ever again. And I'm like, oh my God, you are right. Like I didn't get to, oh my God, you're right so fast, but I really <laughs> did, get, you did really get there. You know? I did get there and I'm like, you are totally right. And I think that's when we added excuses to the A, B, C, D, E. Mm. But um did you yeah. come up with that, Fran, or is that some – I've never heard that before. Well, I think yeah. it's – you know, this is like part of my life's work. I think we, we hear, you know, B, C, D often, blame, complain, defend. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, A belongs there. You know, when you make assumptions, you're just an ass. So yeah. it's like A has got to go in there. Yeah. And E was definitely the excuses piece, but I, I don't look for mm. – I don't yeah. look for more. I feel I like you have another to, book. You I feel like there's <laughs> another book there, like – the A, B, C, D, E rules of leadership or something? Um, I don't know. I think that's just a lesson that goes throughout. Yeah. But just I don't a, just know. Just planting a seed for you there. There's yeah, your next think, book. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So she slammed the water. Did you realize at the time, okay, I did this? Or it was, just in, it was so emotional in the moment that you were just kind of, you weren't even I, paying attention to it? I, I just got lost. I really yeah. got, I lost myself in it. And I just, I didn't. I didn't care. I wanted to just drive my point and that's not what team members do. Like you just, mm -hmm. you just don't do that. Um, and you can't, you always have to back your team, but what's, what's amazing and, and not defend their work, right? Like design is subjective. So you just have to nuance what you like, what you don't. And then again, not defending, but when you, when you draw research into from trends or colors or whatever it is, into the conversation, you're, you are not bringing the defense component. You are not getting defensive about your design. It, it's, it's not about that, right? Yeah. So if we always, if we stay true to our mission and true to our mm -hmm. vision, right? We, we only care about one thing and helping CEOs actually realize visions because visions, no matter how big or small they are, if they're written correctly and they're measurable, you can actually achieve them. So if, we get, if we're just focused on achieving them through our mission, which is closing the gap between marketing and sales, but rallying everyone around you around this purpose component, because purpose really is your superpower. And when you can, you're going to get me off on a tangent. So reel me back anytime you want. But Tangents are good. Yeah, but it's, yeah. You know, it's, it's always about these three keys for us. 
because it's just internally, externally, doesn't matter if you're working on a brand component or a, a marketing, an external piece or a brand experience. It's, it always starts with what's the purpose of it? Why does it exist? You know, what's the goal? How does it align to your annual goals, right? Keeping it very CEO centric, as I say, and stop getting lost in this busy uh, likes and unless, unless it leads to engagement and conversion, it doesn't right. mean anything. Yeah. Which is, which is, I think, probably rare for someone doing branding to talking about conversion and, uh, in, you know, not just engagement, but conversion to leading to something. So your approach is actually taking that, but like, what's the, and we'll talk about the lumpy mail because you like, well, what's the call to action? Like, what's the next step? Right. And because there has to be a next step. So we'll talk about that, but just to, for that particular story, that failure story, um, where does that weave into the book? Like, It weaves into the book on the values piece, right? It. Because it, if, if I don't behave in a way that is driven by our culture and I act outside of the norm, right? So we have a, a five core values and doing what's needed, uh, earning trust, there's, if I don't back my team emotionally, whose trust am I breaking? And by the way, it's, I, I see build trust in core values all the time. I'm like, building trust, you can build trust all you want, but you have to earn it. Earning it is way harder than building it. Mm -hmm. And I don't do, God knows everybody knows, I'm, 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 always, I'm always good for the hard work. But if you can't, when you can earn their trust, if you earn trust, you, you really can, you can weather almost anything because they trust you. Right. There's always outside factors. The question is, if you've identified the true goal and your eye is always there and you've earned your trust of your client, you can pretty much weather anything. And that shows up in the longevity of our client, you know, our client relationships. We like to think of them as a bungee cord, not umbilical cord. We're not your regular agency. We're very CEO minded, very transparent, very metric driven. Because let's, let's be honest, Jeremy, every agency in the planet gets measured on sales and increase of sales. And marketing is not sales as a responsibility. It goes hand in hand. But if we can't positively affect, shorten, improve qualified leads and shorten close rates, we're useless. So everything, you have to men measure really unconventional things to actually prove the value. And that's where we're focused. Because if, if you're not getting good marketing value out of the agency or the you know, dichotomy of freelancers, you really should be rethinking what you're spending your money on. Because you're either spending too much time managing those fragmented components, or it's just not focused in the way that you need to drive the actual results you need. Let's talk about box experience, um, you know, because they came to you and what I love, like you were saying about, you mentioned before being vulnerable, like that's when we actually make our biggest breakthroughs yeah. because we're willing to look at the things maybe that aren't working perfectly um, and we can make improvements. And at that point, you know, everyone got hit with the, with the craziness that happened um, and people's businesses were affected in the U S you know, but, uh, she was ready to make some pivots and changes. And so maybe talk to talk about, um, you know, your thought process when you started working with her, because you really kind of drew this up from scratch and she drew this up from scratch. So it's such a great story. Um, triumph over She's like, Fran, you have one week. Yeah. Like, we have one week. Like, what, what can we do? L literally. Yeah. Um, literally, literally, we had four weeks to figure yeah. out what a new business looked like. And um, I don't recommend it for many people. For anyone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you have to definitely have a certain amount of like, sure, let's, let's create a new brand. Let's pull all the narratives and key messages together. Uh, let's understand. Let's build the product at the same time as well as launch a website. Okay, got to have your head examined. So I'm the right type of head examined to do something like that. But I'll tell you what's, um, what's really incredible about this, about Boxperience, but really about Andrea. So Andrea is probably one of the most, you know, I, say this, I say this often, but highly, highly purposeful individuals. 
she brings joy and connection to everything that she does in our in personal relationships you, it shows up absolutely everywhere and i know this because i've asked her right and i've i've seen her in action so I, I definitely had a little bit of a head start it wasn't like i didn't know her before she kind of called me and said i'm in chicago there is no more events i mean this is a woman who catered for oprah this is a woman who has an incredibly thriving business who does really good things for the community and the community, the entrepreneurial community, as well as her local community. And very, very purpose driven. Wasn't really difficult to pull the, the three keys, you know, in a succinct way out of her. And then starts to brainstorming okay, what can I do? Well, clearly it has to involve joy, clearly it has to involve connection, clearly it has to involve experience. So what can I do that's portable? How can I create, how can I pivot my events company into something portable? And there went a lot of very good and bad and expensive and cheap um, opportunities. And we landed on creating what we define as box experience, right? A portable connective relationship that reinforces something new, reinforces what you have or starts something new. Because in the world we live in today, literally today, you cannot jump on a plane and take care of your most valuable clients. So what are you going to do? There goes dinner, drinks, events, uh, summits, conferences. It's gone overnight. Don't know when it's coming back. Maybe 2020 maybe 2021. We don't know. What are you going to do? So she really, we, in this 31 days, we clearly wanted to test some proof of concepts, talk, talk, talk. How do you to approach salespeople? And we really came up with this box experience, this portable experience that you can send someone that is so personalized. Um, that you can really deepen your relationship. And she's got a couple of different themes, a couple, couple of different flavors. And the way that she personalizes these things, it is not a gift box. It's really, it's just not. And it is absolutely a new category. And it is not for marketing, you know, to order a hundred for their salespeople. Mm -hmm. It's for their sales teams to say, I have travel budget and expense budget, and they have another way to use it. Yeah. And they uh, they can you know send it's for two VIP boxes. VIP clients. It know? is for VIP. And if, clients. if anyone sees it, I mean, you could watch that episode. But um, it's a beautiful box. I mean, the box itself yeah. people keep. It's like a nice wooden box, and so it's like people wouldn't just throw that out. Like actual the box it comes in is really nice too. Yeah, the whole thing about it is personalized in a way that it actually isn't about box experience, it's about the connection. So on the cover of that box, it says, you know, let's connect. And on the other side of the box, there's a personalization. And then there's a great experience. There's a recipe card. There's an audio or a visual card from you with your voice or your face saying, hey, I really miss you. I wish we could have da 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 whatever like we used to do, but like, let's just jump on, you know, FaceTime or Zoom and like, let's have a glass of wine. Let's do some cooking or share the experience with your family and let's, Let's bond over how that happened. And I mean, I've sent a bunch and I've gotten great responses from my VIPs and I know that she's really starting to thrive and move into even some more customized, you know, uh, relationships where, you know, she's dealing with events and she's, you know, sending a hundred for, you know, in place of an event component. So she's starting to expand that as well. And it's really beautiful to see all of this happen. Um, if anyone wants to check it out, it's time. Box Experience, but it's B O X P E R I E N C E dot net. So you can check it out what they have going on there in some of the different boxes. But it is there's a personalized components, um, and you know on that lumpy mail. So like everyone loves, you know, when you sent those initial tests out, like you know to test the market. Mm -hmm. What were some of the responses? How did you take that feedback and kind of change a little bit? So that's actually a great question because we didn't really have a lot of time to do a lot of testing. So it was like, okay, let's send, I don't know exactly how many boxes she sent out, but she sent out a fair amount. And the truth is, you know, it's very transparent in today's 
day and world, you can actually go on to Facebook and LinkedIn and see many of them. So people were actually didn't know what they were getting and recorded it going, oh my God, this was great. Like, I love this. There was, there were some nuances like, hey, this truffles, oh, I wish I had a few more. Oh my God, I love this, but I wish I had the recipe card. I wish I had more truffles. Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, but by and large, I think there was a, there was a real, we learned that people really do enjoy alcohol boxes. We enjoyed that they like cooking boxes. We learned, um, that it was, it was, the price point was right. The level of personalization was right. We thought people would actually want to record more video. And it, I remember doing this with, uh, well, it wasn't that long ago when I said, you know, we should also do just an audio option. She goes, no, I think the video will be great. And I'm like, you know what, let's test it. Gee, big, big surprise there. Um, and we did, we tested it and I see, it seems that people don't like want to get like all dressed up or, you know, really fuss with the video, but they think the audio card is enough. And just having that pop of hello, and then a really nice message, you know, from her mm -hmm. saying, Hey, I started this new thing. I'm really interested in your feedback. So it was really cool to see those as proof of concept pieces. Um, but as far as the language is concerned, I think we really, we hit a lot of it. I think the modification came more into like the lead gen and some of the cold calling. That's really where we took the scripts uh, to another like the level. Follow up. Yeah. And, and yeah, in creating the follow up, I think we really hit it. We hit it out of the box kind of really straight away. And of course it's evolving. We're adding now, you know, a buy online, you know, component. We really, we, we really went up with bare bones. I know that she's added another four and we'll continue to evolve uh, some pure customized solutions. Maybe you don't want Let's Connect on the front. The one thing you can't have, I have told her as a garden rule, you cannot put your logo on the front. It has to be emotional. You could put your logo on the back as your, you know, the customer, you know, as your company, but right. it's not important first, right? That goes right into the lumpy mail conversation. What do you recommend for follow-up? Because I know you, you always say, the key is the follow-up. Don't just send the gift, but like, so what do you recommend maybe, you know, cause there's text, there's call, there's email. And then how, uh, how much after do you follow up? What do you recommend as far as follow-up goes? So this, this goes into the whole sales strategy, which Deb Venable um, is really, really good at. And I want to say there's a triangular piece here. Um, so in building the scripts and trying to understand the frequency, you know, there's different categories of people and how they respond and what they like. So number one, actually creating a follow-up that is multi-part, right? So maybe one component is posting something online about the conversation, appreciating the video that they sent, or the, and even being honest about the feedback because you really just want this to completely evolve. And Andrea was so great about taking all the criticism and the feedback. Um, and there, there, was, there was a few, I, I can't say there was an overwhelming like, oh, this is just like a gift box. I, I think we honed in some of the messaging so they really understood that it was meant that we want you to actually, you know, the sender should create the follow-up and actually encourage the reach based on the calls to action that they're reading. So that actually has a lot to do with the verbal message that we suggest you send. And as the sender, you, you know, like, Hey, I don't know if I was, if Jeremy, if I sent you a box and you were like, Hey, I got this, I got this. I probably would take a snap of our zoom and I would probably post it yeah. because it's, it's really what about I usually do. If I get something personally is I will take a picture with it and text it to the person and just like write up personalized texts thank you. And like, maybe like an audio in the text to say, you know, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But yeah, why I, not put yeah. that, why not put that out with like a lesson, right? Yeah. Like why, why not? E even if it's like, wow, my customer really appreciated this. I, I just love them. I'm so glad they enjoyed it. I mean, and as the receiver, that. I do that as like, yeah. if I receive it. Yeah. But I'm saying flip it, right? Yeah. Like you flip the script. I'm saying flip, flip this. And you as the sender do the same because you, can actually highlight the fact that they meant so much to you that you mm, even did that. Got it. So it's it's it does put a different perspective on it, and not from a salesy way, right? This is this is relationship building. We are in a relationship economy, so give them value everywhere. Yeah, so, you know, totally. It, 
it's got value to box experience. It's got value to the sender. It's got value to you to show how thoughtful you are, how much you care about, you know, the boxes you send for the reasons you sent them. So it, it, it really does elevate the relationship. And to be honest, that's exactly what Andrea's intention was with Box Experience. So yeah. being true to her core and true to who she is. And all of a sudden, by the way, she didn't think catering was going to open up at all. And now all of a sudden she's watching her catering come into small groups as she's pivoted that as well. So that poor girl woman has not slept in a couple of months, but I'm thrilled to see her embrace, you know, the, the value of the human relationship and the connection. And she's, she's just all about it. And I, I couldn't be happier to be part of that. Um, no matter how challenging it, it was and maybe continues to be yeah. in a good way. And I just want to see that completely thrive because I, well, I appreciate really you happy. sharing the, the story. Let's go from box experience to Jay-Z. Oh yeah. So what, oh, what is, so talk about how Jay-Z relates to lumpy mail for you. Jay-Z. Okay. So what happens when you own uh, or open this really swanky uh, membership driven bar? What do you do? How do you really not just attract people to the bar, but going, oh my God, there's a second level of floors with these millions of dollars in paraphernalia with themes and really meant to offer private breakouts. How do you sell that? Well, you sell it by membership, right? Exclusivity. And you deliver it in a way that they are so excited and proud to have forked over that small fortune for this luxurious experience. So if you don't deliver value for their small fortune, no matter what level they chose, you're going to be sunk. So not only does the experience the welcome box, if you will, has to be spot on, but it has to be the gift that keeps on giving, right? So you have to create the portable piece that they can carry with them, that they can use as a showpiece that is incredibly special. So in the days where uh, the black card was metal and it was the only metal credit card, uh, we developed a magnetic stripe on an a equally personalized metal card at three different value or membership levels and created um, a box that became the container that be went into another box. So there was a complete, you know, this was when unboxing start began. Opening experience. Yeah, yeah, this was all about the opening. You had to touch it and feel it. It was like this crazy tactile experience, which by the way, was a box of an envelope. And you open that to reveal another incredible It's like one of those Russian experience. dolls things where you just keep <laughs> opening it. And it's like- yeah. <laughs> and, and the goodness is inside, but you know, yeah. like the Russian dolls, yes, there was an unboxing boxing component, but it was tactile and it was experiential through each, right? So you open you, to reveal another box, which you slid out and then that opened up, right? It, it flipped open and then there was a personalized like translucent letter that was tucked into a pocket. And then that revealed oh, the golden ticket, right? The, the black card, if you will, that was by color, so it was easy to recognize. It was magnetic, so they could really swipe it and they could charge drinks to it in their internal system, so it had a lot of functionality. And then there was a booklet inside this mini kind of like portable box folder that's laid out all the things that you could do in all the rooms and all the themes and tons of suggestions so that you could you know, come and be encouraged to even spend more small fortunes and build great relationships and build your network because the people that were roaming kind of like the floor in those walls in those rooms uh, were new relationships to be had. So uh, from what we, we've done them for several years and they haven't changed it because it is still uh, delivering great with great expectation and great anticipation. So. This is from one of Jay Z's clubs, right? In yeah, forty forty in the heart of you know on twenty six and Broadway, right in the heart of the city. And I'm how did they hear about you? How did they find you? How did they find me? Um, I, I th a lot of it's about connections. I think when we're we we do a lot of award winning 
kind of lumpy type, I would say packaging type work. So when we get, you know, the ability to really build the experience um, and we get the budgets to do that, we really can build some incredible things as we, as we have. And, they, yeah. you know, they just were proven, right? Like, nope, we're just going to reorder more, just going to reorder more. That's when, you know, that's the validation of going, okay, do you want to change anything? We just update the booklet for different themes and as they, as mm -hmm. they move. So, yeah. And, and I encourage anyone, Fran, to check out advantages.net. You know, you have the, our work and there's a bunch of case studies there, which are really cool. And they can see the, four, they, they want to look at actually what it looks like. They can go to 4040 VIP experience and you can actually look through some of the pictures. It just, I love looking through those things just to give ideas, even if it's so for something totally separate, just to see some of those ideas. Um, and do you remember, I don't know if you control the send out of it, but does anything stick out of, wow, like we create this and this is getting sent to X, Y, Z people who everyone knows or, or do you not necessarily, you kind of hand it over and they, they do the sending? Um, no, we actually sent it out for, for a couple of years, I think up until about mm. last year, year, year and a half, maybe, maybe two years ago. Um, because remember each card is personalized. So there's a bit of a step that goes, um, and you know, in house there were like, it wasn't really, they weren't sending out hundreds a week, so we could really manage it. And we felt it needed kid gloves. And most of them, by the way, were hand delivered. Mm. Um, I, You're like, I'll deliver this one is going to uh, uh, <laughs> Will Smith or something. No. <laughs> I, I, I can only deny that. Um, we yeah. actually had to sign um, a, a non-disclosure of who the client list was. Yeah. But there was no doubt. Uh, we definitely had a lot of smiles and we almost like wished we could have hand delivered ourselves. But yes, there were a lot of very famous people, uh, some of which you would not even you know, suspect like it's just like writers and Broadway, just a lot yeah. of very really, but who's really who maybe things. maybe even some of the behind the scenes, but they're very influential in that very in that realm. Yeah. Yep. Uh yeah, I would even say some big uh money Wall Street guys, some real estate moguls, mm -hmm. some very interesting names on that list. I definitely wouldn't win of mine hand delivering that or been at one of their parties. <laughs> Gatherings, no doubt. Now, have you been to the 44? Have you been to the club before? Or? Of course. Yeah, okay. I, 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 we are experiential. Are you kidding? We took the yeah. whole team out there once, uh, yeah. once we act, actually, we went twice. We went once uh, to see all the rooms so we could experience it, right? How could I build an experience if I couldn't get excited about the, what the experience was? So we took You're like, we need to try every drink, every food item. We need to, uh, you need to about, give us the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just about. Um, yeah, we were there for a couple of hours. We didn't, nice. we didn't, we didn't go home walking straight. That's for sure. Um, but <laughs> we brought, we brought a lot of the experience, you know, into it. When you want to bring something to life, you have to really understand it. And, and, and I'm not saying that we get the opportunity all the time to do things that are local, that we can take things to that level. Um, but, you know, no doubt when we take a project like that, somebody's, somebody's in person for sure. Yeah. Let's go on the opposite end. So we go Box Experience, Jay-Z, and then we, there was a grant. So talk about uh, that. Yes. The impossible challenge. What happens when a Wall Street mogul who is attached to educational experiences tasks an organization with a new opportunity and they have no idea what to do? I feel like, you know, one of those movie trailers, we need a, like a really deep voice to read what you just read. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know. For some reason, when you don't know what to do, they tend to call me. I really do get the hard, the hard, uh, the hard things to figure out. But the truth is, we love that um, because we're very clear, right? When we understand what the true goal is, we can really keep ourselves very focused. When we understand what the budgets are, and I don't mean just money, I mean like time, um, labor. You have to really understand what's involved. So this grant um, had a had a had a couple of real like deal breakers where they had to advertise in the wall street journal i'm like okay well how do i get to if the task of the grant was to convince guys on wall street a specific list of 150 um 148 to be exact to actually donate in a 24 month period over a million dollars right out of their will bequeathed in their will that's that's a really interesting what do you do with that? Changing wills. Agency? Yeah, that's, yeah. What do you do with that marketing agency? Well, you take that grant and you abide by the rules. So you call the Wall Street Journal. 
and you figure out how many over a period of time we can advertise to build some recognition, right? How many, so that ate a good part of the budget. And then we had to figure out how were we going to target, right? So now that, that goes to the broader. So we had to build a website, right? That drove traffic there. But how are we going to deal with 148 that this guy, you know, curated? By the way, some pretty famous names as well. Um, so you got to give them something. A, you can't ask them for anything. Got to build a relationship. Got to start somewhere. So you got to tug on something. So this was about education. So we had to do something surrounding education. So we did it around a holiday and hey, remember when you were younger and this was really important to you and how you want to create this environment for your children. So we kind of, you know, had to dig into the persona of, the, of these hundred and, you know, the average of the 148 and what would be important to them and how we would get to them. And we created two lumpy mail, gorgeous customized boxes, by the way. I think they're still on the website. Um, which would it be under? Uh, All of education? No, oh. no. Well, if anybody wants to see them, I'll probably get them back up on the website if they're not there. Um, National Society for Jewish Education. So we sent our first lump email, was strategically placed, again, in concert with these ads where, you know, what's your best investment? That was pretty much the theme. Mm. But when you invest in education right? When you education, when you invest in education, they educate people. When you invest in education who educate people, good people who have good educations do great things, right? Mm. So we highlighted um, uh, Beat Buffett was our first one. Trump Trump was another one. Um, and Soar Like Soros. And I'm, Soar Like Soros was my favorite because we got a cease and desist. And we what is what it. does that mean, Soros? Like Soros, Sora like Soros, uh, Soros yeah. on Wall Street. I mean, he's just like this incredible mogul. Just yeah, like these are really very influential Wall Street guys. Yeah. So we started with that, with those titles, and you know, and then spoke about investing in education. You know, and go visit our website. And for the hundred and forty-eight, you know, we sent uh, we 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 took your traditional Hanukkah dreidel with your traditional box with a magnificent custom brass menorah. Just, you know, just evoking the feeling like go off and do celebrate with this menorah and appreciate the value of Jewish education. Hmm. So that, um, that led to a number of conversations. Some people are like, what are you wasting money if you're trying to do that? Some of it was great. Like, wow. They hit, they, they hit the, the heartstring of, you're right, we need to do that, let's go to lunch. Those lunches became dinners and relationships where they did hit their target and be, you know, get the bequeath. I don't know exactly how or where the goal was like sort of through their wills, if you, if you will. Um, but I, I know that, that it was a short-term grant and target. It took Again, it took a while for those relationships to, to build, but they did nurture those relationships properly. Uh, we did talk about scripting. What's the purpose? What are we getting out of the first meeting? What are we getting out of the second meeting? We took it all the way down. So from website to like almost alternate brand to, you know, having that come alive on these boxes, getting them up both hand delivered. One was for Passover, one was for, you know, Hanukkah. And it was just... You know, it was it was incredible, and we didn't even know that it was going to work right for some time. So we kept. It's a really on long, it. like talk about I mean, a sales cycle. It's like someone changing their will. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not well, like was, oh, four weeks later, sure, let me just change everything in my in my will. Yeah, but so but that was a long term goal, right? So we you yeah. have to measure unconventional things. So out of the hundred and forty eight hand deliveries, we had a really high what we call return touch rate. So we had over 60%, good, bad, or indifferent, first measure, they reached back out, whether they liked it or not. And then it was, okay, out of that 60%, can we get to 30% in-person meetings? Whether it was coffee, lunch, whatever it was. And they, we, really, we really laid out these really strong, aggressive metrics. And if we didn't get on the first one, would we achieve it on the second one? And we really hit all the targets, so we didn't, 
uh, we only plan to go through April, but um, we hit the goals that we set to do. What we didn't expect was Soros giving us the cease and desist. What happened? Oh, he just sent us a cease and desist. Like, how dare you advertise my name in the Wall Street Journal? I mean, it was good. I don't understand. So it was like a of, nice thing, but he... It, yeah. 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 So you sometimes, what do they say? Good, bad PR is good PR. So it was right. kind of like our proud, it was our proud moment. Um, that, that he <laughs> they got not, noticed, right? It, like if got you noticed. get a cease and desist, it gets noticed. <laughs> it, right. So we still valued the get notice piece, but he did not give us any money for the grant. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, went some So, losing. you know... Who does all those meetings? Like, do they designate certain people to do the call or the in-person, you know, dinner? How do you, you know, divvy that up from an organization? Well, typically when you're working with a grant, with someone who's really controlling that grant in a, you know, like it, I, it's not like you had an RFP that you could go get it, right? It was, yeah. Somebody had an idea and said, I have X amount of dollars. I want this organization to spend that money and to yield this. Like that doesn't, that happens more often than you realize. But then these organizations don't know what to do with that. Like, how do I build a program? Now, typically they're going to have some kind of fundraising department. So that, that team um, and our team and the creative team, strategy, creative, writing, we're all in a room figuring this out and building the brand and building the, the program and seeing what works and what doesn't. Because at this point, it's just all personal relationships. There's not there's not really any more letters that are going to go out, right? It's these two lumpy mails and you get to hit them strategically in the Wall Street Journal about six or seven times and that's it. So we went from, you know, the famous people beat Buffett to, okay, look what we've invested. We shifted our, after the Hanukkah mailing, we said, oh, there was a speaker in the White House right? Who went to a Jew, you know, Jewish education. It was, had this education and look how we elevated him, right? The chief of, um, at the time, I think he still is the chief, uh, one of the chiefs at NYU. He had a Jewish education. Like this is what Jewish education produces. It was like a, it was a shift and it was, it was a very intentional experience in the messaging and how we could, you know, newspaper touch, you know, once they called us or reached, then we had the opportunity to create different emails or, you know, different touch components in that way. So what, um, what's the organization? People want to check it out. Um, so, well, that's over. So you won't, yeah. you won't find that live anymore uh, because it was the national, national society for Jewish education. Got it. So I don't think that that website is actually up and live at this point because it was very, um, it was like a uh, period of time. Yeah, Got it. very specific. Nice. But the legacy of that uh, lumpy mail lives on for yeah. sure. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. You know, I always ask, Fran, first of all, thank you. I love hearing your thoughts and everything around lumpy mail and people can check out, you know, the case studies that you have and actually get great ideas and see what you've done. And if they obviously need uh, help, they can contact you through the contact page. Um, I always ask this since Inspire to Insider, Fran, what's been um, a challenging moment, time in the business? Um, and then what's been a proud moment on the flip side for, for you in the business? What's, um, what's been a challenging point where you had to push through? Well, first of all, I'm going to say, well, which one should I talk about? Because <laughs> like, seriously, um, I, think, I think what I would still highlight the most I, I'm going to highlight two because I, I think there's such, there's learning from one to the other. So when my business partner and husband passed away just two months before 9-11 and I lost, mm -hmm. you know, really 60% of our business evaporated overnight, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have my support system, not in my personal life and not in my business life. And, you know, that was really, really hard to navigate and to get, to understand how to then put my own spin on it and how do I make this business my own and how do I create an environment that I wish I had for myself, um, which led to, you know, all these incredible things, right? Which then took me to 2008 and 2010. We had to do it all over again because we had some really great divisions doing really great things that were really, really profitable and overnight that dried up. And we went on to make the Inc. 5,000 and 550 best places to work. And I didn't do it to check those lists off. I did it 
because we were purposeful and intentional. We never took our eye off the ball about wanting to help CEOs and leaders realize those visions that they really truly want to realize and give them the opportunity to help close the gap between marketing and sales through that effort. I'd say my proudest moment, and by the way, it's no, sim, no similarity. Like there's n- no doubt there's tons of similarities between COVID being in Queens, yeah. New York at the heart of ground zero once again, serving primarily uh, a large portion of small business. So we're definitely rebounding and in, in incredible ways. So it'll be, it would be the world's for, forced pause that we've, we, you know, that we've bounced from in a great way. So that was, um, that will prove itself for sure. Um, and I never let, lost sight of that optimism, for sure. Not, not once, even though no matter how hard, or hard it was. And the, That I sounds the, devastating. Uh, yeah. It, Can't imagine. It is pretty devastating. You know, when you're, when you're attending three funerals a day for 13 days straight, and you're trying to serve the community as I serve on the executive committee of the Queen's Chamber, I'm literally from the business community on the heart of it. And as my family is very active in the, in the local and Jewish community, there's so much I can't between ventilator uh, ventilators or just food, shopping. I, I can't, it was just, it was a very difficult time. I still never lost my undeniable positivity, knowing if I've survived everything else, really, I can't survive this. Um, but not, not making light of it and being super scared through it um, for me and my team. And a proud moment. I, I, I'm going to say the proudest moment was when, gosh, I, there's also, there's, there's two for two different reasons. One is when Cameron Harold Facebook messaged me and going, I am so proud of you. Um, I am so proud of the work that you do and the team that you lead. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you made the 50 best places to work. And I was like, I was like, what? You're kidding me. And I, you, that's not something you apply for. It's, it's just, it, you just don't know, like, you just don't know that it happens. Yeah, obviously my team was involved, but I didn't know anything about it. And honestly, Advantages is, is the place where I really just wish, it's the environment that I wish I had for myself when I was younger to be a place of support, a place of growth, a place of learning, to do great things, to celebrate the wins, and to work really hard to do it. So I'm super, probably proudest moment. Most meaningful and proudest moment was when I absolutely realized in London, as my husband handed me this Tiffany box, which A, scared the crap out of me, because that's a big blue box, um, that held three little diamond keys. And it was just hours before our London book launch on January 23rd. And I, I didn't realize the magnitude of work and the body of my life's work that actually culminated in this book. And it was such, it was such a, it was such a proud moment to share that with my husband and Don, my, my really great friend. It was something that we had labored over um, and just something to really to celebrate. So those are, you know, from a professional perspective, those are re- tr- two tremendous highlights for me. Amazing. Fran, thank you. I uh, first want to thank you, everyone. Check out advantages.net. Check out Fran's amazing podcast, Drive Profit with Purpose podcast. She has amazing guests, amazing insights. Check it out. And their book, How to Lead a Values-Based Professional Services Firm, The Three Keys to Unlock Purpose and Profit with Don Scales. Fran, thank you. Jeremy, it's been a pleasure. Rise 25. (laughs) Everyone have a good time on the flip side. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same.